So this has been incredible, right? Um, after Chad's talk, I feel kind of weird talking about uncertainty because he seemed to give us all a great deal of certainty. Um, but we'll keep calm and carry on. Uh, I, I'd like to talk to all of us today about this idea of being comfortable with uncertainty. We're Ember. We're a little bit smaller. And um, I hear in Discord chat a lot, people asking me questions or being worried about the future of Ember or being worried, why aren't we as popular, all these things. And I just keep coming back to this idea. So that's where this talk's kind of coming from. But we're gonna start with a little story. Story about a samurai. Samurai went to see a Zen master and he said, teach me about the nature of heaven and hell. And the Zen master looked at him and said, why? Why would I teach you? You're not worthy. You're dirty, you're smelly, you're a disgrace. Now, that's pretty um, ballsy because a samurai has a great katana. A Zen master, a pillow. The samurai pulls out his great katana and he's just about to shove it into the Zen master when the Zen master says, now you understand hell. And the samurai realizes that it was his ego and his anger that caused a situation where he was about to take another life. And he got really sad and started crying. And the Zen master said, it's OK. And the samurai said, I'm just so grateful that you were willing to do this to teach me this lesson. Uh, Heaven, you now understand, the master said softly. OK, maybe I'm paraphrasing a little. Um, but in a world of social media, of Twitter, of Discord, of oh, hacker news, um, Reddit, mm, which one of those people are you? When somebody says something uh, inflammatory off the cuff about Ember, oh, Ember's dead. Oh, people still use Ember? Like, do you snap back at them or do you pause and wait? And what do you do when these people are in your own company, sitting at the desk beside you? Now, I don't know about you, but people being wrong on the internet is the primary reason I don't get as much sleep as I should. And I am a mother. But in all seriousness, how we relate to this moment, to each of those moments, sets a stage. It's training ourselves. We are intrinsically training ourselves to how we will, will relate not only to the next moment, but to future moments. How we choose to respond has a great deal of power in our lives, whether we realize it or not. With our responses, we can open the door to new possibilities. But when we respond in anger, we can close the door to new possibilities. Responding with anger or fear does exactly this. It closes the door to new possibilities. Somebody who might have tried Ember, who was like, oh, they're mean. It's so funny to hear that, because no, we're not. But maybe, <laughs> right? The thing is, we all have fear. Every single one of us. The person who is saying those things in that moment, like making that snarky comment, it's not about us at all. It's about them and how they're feeling in that moment. But somehow we tend to take it personally. But what we have to remember is we all have fear. We all have discomfort. And we can never avoid uncertainty. I mean, 
isn't there, in the US we have the saying, I don't know anywhere else, uh, the only thing is certain is death and taxes, right? Um, maybe in other parts of the world it's just death that's certain. <laughs> uh, so we can never un avoid uncertainty, but we can learn to become comfortable with it. We can choose, we could ask ourselves, do I prefer to grow up and relate to life directly? Or do I choose to live and die in fear? We can learn to be brave. Now, brave, whew. What does that mean? Being brave simply means we have chosen to cultivate fearlessness, like a practice. It's a type of thing we exercise. Um, I'm not a person who likes, generally, in my life, has liked to get up in front of people and talk. I prefer to be the person behind the curtain, doing the organizing and telling people what to do. That's way more fun. Uh, but this was something I chose to cultivate. It's time for me to do this. OK, I'll do it. And that's exactly what it means. So we can cultivate this fearness through some tools that we can give ourselves. And today I'd like to talk to you about three of them that I'd like you to consider. Observe, analyze, and think. People are often wrong <laughs> on the internet. And everyone here is laughing, because it is kind of funny. But no, seriously, when you see stuff like that, how does that make you feel? Because when I see stuff like that, I think a few things. Uh, first, I'll laugh and say, oh, I know a lot of nobodies then. And then I'll think, wait, well, I'm not a nobody. And then, wait, what if I am a nobody? And then, jackass. Sorry, pardon my French. So in those moments, step back for a second. It gets easier the more it happens, the more you practice. It's like a thing, muscle memory almost, emotional muscle memory. Observe the reaction or feeling. So I feel angry that this person said this thing about the thing that I like. Try putting I observe. Take the feeling and Abstract it, abstract it, ember, see? Um, observe it. I observe that I feel angry that someone would say something like that about something I like to do. And this is an important part of it. Practice speaking about that observation because speaking it out loud will help your own brain learn the thing and make it more real to you until it is part of your practice. Um, you could also try something like this. I observe that you are incorrect because of the internet. So let's go to the next one. Let's learn how to analyze the claims that people make, especially on the internet. Uh, maybe we're talking about scientific research. There's always a new study out. Or maybe we're talking about some kind of, oh, I don't know, state of JavaScript survey, not that such a thing exists or that I would be commenting on it. The data says that 50% of developers use React. We're going to use our observing skills for a moment and pause. How do you observe that that just made you feel? Hmm. Then we're going to analyze the context. So there's a few different parts of the analyze skill. The first part is the context. Okay. Let's pull out the irritating bits and use variables. Uh, the data says 50% of people who do X use Y. Okay, 50%. Hmm. 50% of what, though? The data says, if you dig deeper, 50% of people who responded to the survey that do X Use why? Hmm, I don't know about you, but that got me thinking a little bit. How many people actually responded to this survey? So we can approach this in a very scientific way. 
Uh, my husband's a research scientist, so I went and like, verified all this information. He tells me I'm good to go, so we're going to just go for it. Uh, if we were to, also these are fake numbers, there's probably more than 10,000 developers in the world. Um, we can approximate that there are 10,000 people who do X. We know 1,000 people who do X took the survey. The survey represents 10% 10 10 of all people who do X. The claim, 50%, therefore represents five people. 5% 5 of all people who do X who also did the survey. Now, if you put it that way, Saying 50% seems a little, hmm, maybe not. But because we're scientists and we're smarter, we're going to actually do another um, scenario. So if we have 10,000 people and 8,000 people took the survey, and therefore the survey represents 80% of all people who do X, then the claim, 50%, represents 40% of all the people who do X who also did the survey. Now, I don't know about you, but 4,000 people out of 10,000 people answering gives me a little bit more um, confidence in the reliability of the data. Um, now, I see some of you, like, your wheels are turning. You're like, yeah, but what if they had a good sample size? And come on, no. So these two scenarios, these type of scenarios alone, just the raw numbers are not enough to determine whether or not the data should be considered valid because it is possible to get a really small population that does accurately represent the whole. So let's look at some other things we should be watching for in these types of data collections. We should be able to analyze the collection methods. Are the data collection methods easily available? If they are not, throw away the study. That should be a red flag to you right away. It's not. If they're hiding how they collected the data, you don't want that data. Does the study tell you who to contact if you have any questions or concerns? If it doesn't, they're hiding something, throw it away. These are red flags every single time. Are you able to reproduce the study? Now, Reproducibility in science is actually a really big thing right now, and Jen Weber actually is working at a company who's trying to fix this problem in science. But in the tech community, we should be aware of these basic principles as part of our toolkit. So when people try to tell us what trends are in internally, we should be able to independently verify them for ourselves. The next thing we need to be able to analyze is uh, who's backing this? Who paid for the study? Who did the research? Do either of those groups benefit in some way, either emotionally or financially or something like that, from a positive outcome? Then it's probably a marketing study and it's probably trying to sell you something and you could probably ditch it. Or at least take it with a giant grain of salt. Take time to think. Make the time to think. There is a really wonderful book called um, Thinking Fast and Slow. A lot of what we do on a daily basis is fast thinking. We learn a thing, we implement it, we ship it. And because of Ember and all the power it gives us, we can do that even faster, right? But we need to make time for slow thought. We need to, that needs to become a critical part of our being is making, and I'm not saying finding the space. You'll never find it if you just say, oh, if it happens. It is, be on purpose. It is purposefully made, it's purpose, purposefully practiced. Take the time to think. When somebody makes a claim, think about it. So then, the future of Ember? What does it hold? I don't have a magic ball, I'm sorry. Over the last two days though, we've heard some really incredible things and I've been so inspired by everyone and how they're using Ember and the hobbies are really great. Y'all are doing such a great job. It's really interesting. Um, and I'm really hopeful. The people I see using Ember happily and productively and contributing, I'm hopeful about these, the future of Ember because of the community. 
But nothing is certain, is it? So as we become comfortable with that uncertainty, that's when we cultivate our fearlessness. So that's my message today. Be fearless. Thank you.